Good morning and welcome to our monthly webcast. I am your moderator, Samir Mehta. This is session number 90. To begin with, I apologize for the delay. There was an extremely challenging uh, access issue, which uh, once you see the anatomy, you'll understand. We are also proceeding today to a unique arena, something which I think uh, many of you would have started confronting in your practice. How exactly do you deal with, how do you manage patients with the dual pathology of severe and critical aortic stenosis and complex coronary artery disease? This is our topic for today, and to illustrate this, we have a patient who fits exactly into the subset, and hopefully Dr. Sharma, through his didactic, will help you understand some of the very important uh, issues uh, that can help you with the decision. So with this, let me take you to the cardiac cath lab where Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kinney are standing by. Samin, uh, good morning. Yes, good morning. That uh, yeah. is uh, the right summary to that explain. Absolutely. To get people started. Yeah. That is true. And particularly now, let's show the gradient. Very, Very challenging gradient. access I was watching for a while. Yeah, it took us more than half hour, where, you know, not unusual. Right. Many of these cases are difficult. We are the VL. Yeah, and uh, basically, uh, as you said, that more and more patients are now coming, combining with the coronary artery disease, uh, with, uh, with aortic uh, structural heart patients, particularly aortic disease. And uh, this is, we thought that it's an illustrative example. Actually, ex three years ago in the ACC live webcast, we did exactly this case, uh, or similar kind of case, I meant, aortic stenosis uh, with a left main and severe three vessel disease. And we did a balloon valvuloplasty and left main and LED PCI. Uh, so this is kind of a replica uh, of uh, the similar situation because this is the, uh, we continue to uh, accrue these kind of cases. And I felt one of the region, besides just doing the structural case, which we do every two months now, and we might hopefully within, there's a lot of demand and that website is improving also. Uh, I mean, a lot of demand so that we might get, start doing it every month. But the key is the more important point and which is basically, which is we all are uh, facing the what to do an angiogram and guidelines and appropriateness and so we'll discuss all those points. So while uh, we are getting ready uh, about, uh, we'll just briefly uh, get to the point uh, with the uh, slide uh, presentation while uh, uh, Dr. Keeney get everything ready for our uh, valvuloplasty. These are our uh, supporters. Uh, the disclosures no different than what before. And this is a 83-year-old patient who presented with both angina and dyspnea. Uh, patient has a known severe AS and managed medically until now having angina on top of it. And then cardiac has revealed extensive three-vessel disease, including total occlusion of the right coronary. And some of the, uh, we can show, uh, I know of AS, uh, uh, I mean the left main and other LED disease. Uh, you see here, moderate left main, I would say about 50, 60 distal left main and uh, circ, which is, uh, distal circ is okay, but especially in uh, OM, another uh, 60, 70 percent disease. Mm. And then if you go to the cranial view, calcified uh, LED, just uh, mm. mid LED, yeah. 70, 80. But then uh, you can see confirm the distal left main disease. And, and RCA is total, we didn't do another uh, injection. I think this is also important when patients are coming to you with uh, um, um, you know, valve disease, there's uh, limited pictures you need to take just to define the coronary uh, uh, disease, uh, especially these are elderly patients who always have some kind of uh, uh, CK, CKD uh, presentation with them. His, uh, what's the career? Uh, 1.4, yeah, so it's yeah. still a borderline CKD for yeah. his age. Well, fortunately, the EF has been preserved, yes, uh, but yeah. you're exactly right. Four plus uh, calcification there and extremely challenging access. Yes. Now, let's go back to the as access view here. This is what we had. So, uh, heavily calcified right side, if you see right at where we have, and this is a case where you can't even uh, use per close. The per close suture is not going to do, do, so we went to the other side, contralateral, and that's where we are. We have two uh, pre close. A and also right one pre close only. One pre close. And, and this case has a multiple PTAs. And look at the calcific. Right. Look at the hole. So, not uncommon for these cases. It has multiple. Uh, iliofemoral, I mean not iliac, but femoral and popliteal PTAs in the past. But uh, clear cut, a skeleton 
of the vascular vessel, which is okay. Well, this is not uncommon for these patients. And we can just show the quickly hemodynamics. We have crossed the vent uh, in the LV, and the gradient is about 50. That's what exactly we felt. Uh, they just had to show a quick uh, hemo, maybe on one side. Yeah. See it now very nicely here. It, yeah. So now just tell us what uh, we use the AR2, and that is our preferred uh, the catheter using. If you the can see here LAO view AR2. Uh, which most of the time, uh, depending on the root side, but AR2 in ma the majority of the cases, and uh, use your uh, angle straight Tarumo wire right here, the way we cross you. Many, uh, LAO view because many times you can see any kind of opening of the aortic valve, and you can just uh, rotate the catheter so you it faces towards the opening of the aortic valve, and you will get the wire in uh, the way we just showed it here. So, Samin, are you intending to do a valvuloplasty and then a PCI? Yeah, that's a good point. So, that question will come. Now, you have decided the patient has a CAD, patient has a severe AS and while you are waiting for the tower and so, what do you want to do? So, what we had done is that combine uh, because many times just the PCI alone and while you are waiting for the tower, uh, many of these AS get deteriorated quite rapidly. So, we try to do both of them. And then question comes when you are doing on the same sitting that what do you do first, balloon BAV or the PCI. I mean I clearly I would say people have done both ways and has been written in the literature, but I would prefer and my logic behind doing the balloon valvuloplasty over PCI is very simple that the AS itself is a bad predictor, one of the predictor in earlier studies uh, to have a bad outcome with the PCI. So, if because of any uh, ischemia uh, you create which we, which is likely particularly somebody like left main. So, we, uh, while the valvuloplasty can be done safely very quickly, so that uh, the, uh, the PCI will be associated can be associated with the higher uh, adverse outcome. So, we always do uh, in our uh, unless it is like a subtotal left main or some other vessel, we always do the PCI uh, the valvuloplasty first uh, and then the PCI. No, and other reason also is in majority of the cases when we are doing your uh, valvuloplasty, one we face and uh, there will be transient hypotension in this patient which could uh, be troublesome Problem if you yeah. already done a uh, stent uh, in the left vein. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Samin, most of these you would like to do it on the same 150 setting? pacing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah same. So, so, this is 20 millimeter ZMAT balloon. Okay, st stop pacing. Talk to the patient. I mean, just what you did used to be a three day stay in the hospital yeah. and a long complicated procedure. Yeah. This is good. Okay. So, always you need to just find out mentally patient is fine. This right. we do a, a on angio bivarudin, one third bolus. Uh, that actually we have published uh, Bravo. Uh, although the randomized trial, 40 before. Yeah, randomized trial of the, uh, no, no, no. the of uh, bivalutin did not show any difference in terms of the bleeding, yeah. slightly lower bleeding, but not other uh, mace point of view. Right. But overall, we found that lower bleeding uh, with the uh, with bivalutin. So the one third bivalutin given in all our. Can they show us the show us the gradient now? Yeah, we are going there We're now. We're checking the gradient right, <laughs> right. now. Diastolic has not changed. Right. Okay. Well, you've significantly reduced it. Yeah. I no, think we are about a, twenty about now. half. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we about usually half. our goal is to decrease half. And don't create a AI uh, unless we are going to do a little aortogram. Because you don't want to b uh, make patient hemodynamically unstable while you are getting ready right. uh, for your tower. So the moderate compared to that aggressive uh, valvuloplasty which we used to do as a stand alone, uh, which could be done palliative in some cases, but usually we just try to bring it down to the half and uh, just to see that there is no regurgitation and so. Yeah. Just, looks looks just a little whiff I think, not yeah. nothing. Okay. Very elegantly performed and I think uh, that is uh, the, the statement which you made, uh, do not be overtly aggressive about it uh, uh, and, and reducing it to half uh, sounds uh, a good uh, yardstick. Good. You want to put a long sheet? You have to put a long sheet yeah, now, yeah. 7th French. Huh? Ah. 
within. So this was the 11 French sheet right. uh, through which now the because of tortuosity, extra we are going to put a 11 uh, the no. seven French Bolus. sheet through it. Bolus on the table. Seven French long. Yeah. Okay, we are giving the extra bolus of the angiomax now. Yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah. So, should you be at this moment uh, paying attention uh, mainly to the reduced gradient, or are you monitoring the pulmonary arterial pressure yeah, also? Nothing. That's a very good point. So, usually, uh, actually, uh, the what happened is in these particular cases, we did a right heart cath is essential because that's how you calculate your. Uh, aortic valve area, uh, we, we did and right heart pressures were normal. What was the cardiac output? 3.0. 3.0. So, the decreased cardiac output which is not uncommon and uh, so, we took the catheter out and put a pacemaker uh, and now we will leave the pacemaker for the time being because we are doing going to do a complex intervention of the left main which we also recommend that many times those cases should get uh, the pacemaker anyway. Uh, because of uh, ch chances of developing a systole or bradycardia, particularly somebody who has a totally occluded right coronary artery. Okay, we got to get uh, we saw Now, question the, uh, to yeah. you was same. What do you monitor? I think as long as you know the gradient has decreased, that's a good enough sign to tell us you can proceed now if the patient is stable hemodynamically. Right now, you see the pr blood pressure, everything is stable to proceed with the PCR. Now, that's the, the question. We will not put a right heart cath. Swan and me uh, measure uh, again cardiac output, check uh, what the PA pressures are doing now. So, I mean the same patient with the depressed uh, LV function is a totally different ball game. In, uh, no. in, in what way? In uh, you know just hemodynamically how the patient, elderly patient is able to tolerate and uh, yeah. I mean, the 65 percent EF hair is affording us a lot of protection. But yeah, exactly. But but you know, many of those patients have low ejection fraction. Right. You still end up doing the same thing. Now there is a true uh, another balloon balloon called true flow. It's just like a perfusion balloon. Right. So during the valvuloplasty, there is still a, a flow across. So we have used one or two cases, but not. Uh, we still need to get some more experience before making any opinion about the true flow. But usually, this short inflation, even this patient, the poor ejection fraction. So what we also try to do in those cases, don't pace them too fast. Right. So maybe you don't need a pacemaker, you just do a balloon dilatation uh, and so, uh, and of course there are various balloons are available uh, with the new mat balloon and which is the hourglass which, is, uh, which does not slippage. There are a lot of work being done using a uh, angiosculpt or cutting balloon in right. these kind of situation. But we'll hear more and more because valvuloplasty has really come up to the plate since uh, the it is kind of prerequisite for many of our cases of the tower patients. Did we end up the pacing in this case? Yes, yeah, we, we did, did for just for, a, for, a short for the valve plastic moment. point yeah. of 150 view. 150 or so. For 30 seconds. Essentially, for 30 what you need to do is if you have a patient with LV dysfunction, the key thing is do not pace the patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens when you are pacing, what you are looking for that your blood pressure has to be less than 40. So, if you have many patients, you will see they are with the blood pressure of 180, you may have to pace faster, 180 or 160 or to see how the blood pressure goes down. So, it is 120, 150, wow, this is the pacing rate. LV dysfunction patient, what we have seen is that when, when you are pacing uh, at a very high rate, the blood pressure goes down and yes. usually they do not recover uh, after that from the low blood pressure. So, that is what we have noticed and uh, in the situation like this, what you can do is just do the valvuloplasty without pacing and when you have LV dysfunction, when we say LV dysfunction, we are talking EF of less than 30. Yeah, got it. And sometime in the teens. Okay, so valvuloplasty first part is done. Now we are second part, uh, which is our coronary, and this actually question will come, and I'll give you the latest uh, recommendation at least uh, where we stand in this field. Uh, while the, Dr. Keen is getting ready and uh, knowing it's a very calcific vessel, we'll use the rotational threctomy. So we are going no, to no, get what a catheter. What do you want to do? Which vessel? I the leave the main circle to, on. Left main to um, uh, yeah, we we'll just do a left main to LED, proximal mid LED. Good. Leave the circle on. Yeah. So for the time being, circle looks okay, right? You want to discuss about this? Let's uh, take a good guide shot again. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So okay, so we can go while we are taking some pictures. Let's go back to our uh, slide presentation. Uh, the patient has been on good medical therapy, and these are the multiple lesions, including 80% circ OM2, uh, which uh, and um, the along with left main, uh, the right heart cath pressures were done today, which are normal, and these are the echocardiographic fact, uh, the data. And of course, syntax score was 38. So this patient had a hard team discussion, and then decided 
uh, that uh, do a BAV and rotor DES of the uh, left main LED and circumflex and then high risk tower in few weeks. So, this patient will uh, get up into the uh, high risk tower group because of the high STS risk score. So, if you take the our the appropriateness of revascularization in this kind of patient, uh, of course, uh, with the high syntax score and aortic stenosis, you say, well, okay, it will be inappropriate, but we also know the appropriateness is based on your guidelines of uh, the heart team discussion. So, so these patients with a complex CAD with high STS and syntax score, you have a heart team approach that is exactly what's done in this particular case. And the discussion then came after heart team discussion, recommendation of BAV and PCI due to advanced age, PAD and comorbid condition followed by tower. And this is actually what should be done in this day and age because we know that is the least traumatic and may even be better approach compared to uh, sending these patients for surgical valve replacement along with the uh, cabbage. So, what happened to slide? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Have you been getting, uh, yeah. a, uh, taking care of a lot more uh, similar uh, patients? Yes. Oh, yeah, the, the very common nowadays. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Very common, uh, this kind of uh, the situation at present. There are so, yeah. so many Good. pertinent issues and I am I'm, I'm glad yeah. that. Uh, so, uh, we can go back we are to the back slide. To the yes, yeah. Exactly. So, I think it is appropriate because of the heart team discussion. So, now we go to two points very quickly while we are getting ready for uh, this particular case. One is the data on the absorbed BVS particularly this uh, I would say the date uh, you know came out uh, from the TCT about the three year data of the absorbed um, the two trial and the recent guideline for cath and PCI with tower patients. So, basically BVS of course, the whole idea of the metallic DES was that you leave it late uh, on long term they develop thrombosis, uh, strut fracture, neoatherosclerosis and uh, visual loss of visual motion and also pul vessel pulsatility, but all those can be taken care by the bioabsorbable. So, clearly the BVS has come into uh, equation with the uh, ever lumos eluting stent and PLLA backbone with 150 micron strut thickness which is much thicker than usual our 75 to 80 micron and uh, shown that yes in uh, 2 to 3 years there is clearly the mass loss resorption of the BVS and uh, idea is that of course, uh, it disappears without causing much inflammation in uh, earlier studies and uh, you cannot have actually any uh, the struts. Uh, by OCT, you cannot see because they all have been dissolved. Uh, this actually has put into various trials which we are all aware. Absorb 2 was the first randomized trial, 2 to 1 uh, randomization of the absorb BVS versus Zions and the one year data which was presented 2 years ago uh, about showing that absorb was non inferior to Zions. Although stent thrombosis was about 0.9 versus 0, but a slightly higher target vessel MI, but overall seems to be okay. Then they presented the data of the two years in the TCT late last year showing that yes trend still continued absorbed slightly higher event rate than Zions, but within limit non inferior, but stent thrombosis now has gone to 1.5. What happened is uh, in end of October in the TCT is this uh, worrisome news of the three year data from the absorbed two trial which raised concern about the first generation by absorbable. Uh, stent and basically what was absorbed what this all about the basically it was a pre specified uh, absorbed two three year outcome because they have a five year outcome also three year outcome were visual motion assessed by intracoronary nitroglycerin and secondly angiographically uh, late lumen loss. So, MLD those were the primary endpoint within the stent and uh, within the scaffold uh, were uh, evaluated separately. So, this is the basically the follow up of the patients 93 percent follow up in both the groups patient came back to have a follow up angiogram I was uh, and uh, of course, the intracoronary nitroglycerin and published in Lancet and basically showed first our two co primary endpoint one was the visual motion by giving intracoronary nitroglycerin which was identical in both including the absorb. So, you say well how uh, and the uh, Zions you say well how can it be the Zions uh, also had a visual motion yes. We were surprised actually and there, there are some data 
in the past with the both uh, with the resolute uh, DES as well as with the Zions that yes, you may restore the vessel with your motion uh, in these patients and this exactly happened in this particular case. So therefore, identical with your motion with both absorb as well as in the Zions. Then late human loss as you can see the non inferiority point of view you have a higher late human loss uh, in the uh, absorb group compared to Zions. So clearly that it was no longer non inferior rather uh, it was actually truly the Zions was superior in terms of a lower late human loss as a primary endpoint. So they lost in the two uh, co primary endpoint at three years you say okay no big deal. Uh, that's okay, but uh, and then these are the individual endpoint on the angiography and I was one thing they also noticed that while there is a the late loss because of and positive remodeling occurs with the science in the uh, with the absorb in the earlier studies uh, because of the the is scaffold discontinuation while with the metal DES there is some intimal hyperplasia and slight negative remodeling that de definitely was seen in these both uh, angiographic and IVAS criteria, but late lumen loss definitely was much higher uh, with the absorbed versus Zions. So then what about the stress test which was more than 0.1 millimeter ST depression, uh, millivolt ST depression which was identical between two groups again no difference and the third one was that people felt that maybe absorb will cause less angina. So Seattle angina questionnaire as you can see at various time points of the various component of the Seattle angina five important ones showed no difference at baseline and three years. So basically uh, all the co primary endpoints and co primary endpoints and secondary endpoints were lost uh, or I would say uh, the, the absorbed lost in this It's still not bad. So overall patient oriented outcome which is three years and you can see here that yes uh, little uh, the height of the absorb which is the yellow bar compared to the Zions kind of except in the MI and so TLR little higher, but overall 21 percent uh, in the absorb group and 24 percent in the Zions group actually look at the mortality it was 2 percent in the absorb and 4 percent in the Zions. So basically there was no difference p value non significant until now does not look too bad. Then is the whole issue came the device oriented the not the patient oriented device oriented composite endpoint of the cardiac death TV target vessel MI and clinically indicated TLR and that was significantly lower uh, in the Zions group compared to absorb was much higher 10 plus versus 5 uh, percent. So basically this was a big news what drove it and which is right here that is cardiac death although was no difference target vessel MI 6 percent versus 1 percent and then stent thrombosis 3 percent versus 0 percent and that was the major big news uh, in the TCT about and that is what uh, picked up by the media that clearly and I would say I would be worried about also having a 6 percent MI uh, compared to a 1 percent in the Zions group uh, and this uh, 3 percent uh, the, the scaffold thrombosis. Now also we learned that only 31 percent of patients were on DAPT and patients who develop scaffold thrombosis none of them were on the DAPT therapy. So it makes sense that it was the DAPT prevented many of these cases resorption and thrombosis uh, at a follow up. Now and then the question was uh, why that happened if you go back to the one year outcome of the absorbed 2 the post dilatation was done in 60 percent and look at the post dilatation atmosphere pressure 14 atmosphere you say why this was done in 2001 uh, 2011 and 12 that to only went to 14 atmosphere because that is the time we taught everybody that do not go high pressure with the absorb because you are going to disrupt the uh, scaffold. So that was the teaching at that time but turns out to be the teaching led to this bad outcome which we learned in the absorb, uh, uh, absorb 2 trial long term also that also led to a lower acute gain. So you can see that clearly the, the instant uh, scaffold uh, acute gain by angiography as well as MLD after uh, by the IVAS all were lower in the absorb group compared to uh, Zions group because we did not go to high pressure we know that in order to expand this absorb stent you need to go to high pressure and that really they put as a conclusion in the Lancet that future studies should investigate the clinical impact of accurate intravascular imaging and sizing the device and optimizing the scaffold implantation the benefit and need for prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy after bioabsorbable scaffold implantation could also become a topic for future clinical research. So should be continued for a long period of time. So there are various uh, data now 
the late scaffold thrombosis is basically part of the absorbing stent. Uh, scaffold may be causing the inflammation uh, and so there are multiple cases which have been shown uh, that uh, overlapping stent, unopposed uh, or malopposed stent, unexpanded scaffold all are associated with high uh, scaffold thrombosis at follow up. Now, the at least some news was that uh, absorbed China showed a very non significant difference in stent thrombosis and outcomes were equal just because lot of patients were done with the imaging. Uh, we know the data of the absorbed three trial one year data were presented and now it becomes very imperative and important for the Abbott point of view that we have a quickly the data of two years and three years of the absorbed three and absorbed four which is still ongoing at present in more complex cases with the target with their primary endpoint of the angina. So, key is that clearly that we need to hear by other studies not absorbed 2 because absorbed 3 we change the protocol, we change the high pressure implantation technique and so and so forth and which became standard uh, and so and we know that small vessels are not good uh, and they should be avoided. So, just to sum it up that basically to me it was the lack of technique of the BVS which led to the outcomes of the absorbed 2 because that has been shown that once you do a pre dilatation appropriate size and post dilate that your scaffold thrombosis from 3 percent goes down to 1 percent. Is that true and this is what we call PSP. I can tell you the data at Mount Sinai we have about 50 plus cases all majority done with the OCT like 45 and uh, all done with uh, the PSP and we actually have no case of TLR, stent thrombosis or follow up MI. Some people have some periprocedural MI in the hospital and the non -T TLR PCI in 4 percent of cases. So, this actually leads to another BVS expand registry overall 1.45 percent I think the technique matters and this actually will be seen by the other data of the absorbed 3 and absorbed 4 and more important absorbed 4 uh, which will be soon available hopefully at least by interim analysis it is important that we need to learn that what are the data of the properly deployed technique uh, in these uh, uh, is scaffold okay and to tell us where are we now so i think a plan initially we had decided maybe we should take care of the circ but if you this is a guide shot if you see prox circ is still okay and uh, the large om uh, we, we still above i would say 60% probably we leave it alone yeah. don't do anything now we have to see the left main which is there and then if you see the lad significant disease just after the large septal and at the level of the diagonal. So, the plan should be that we do rotational atherectomy, maybe take care with 138 stent of the mid uh, and the distal uh, LAD lesion and stent across in order to cutting balloon and stent across the left main uh, into the LAD across the circ. Okay, what size bar you ready? 175 bar and uh, we had to give full dose uh, angiomax patient got Plavix and uh, we are, uh, patient has been on Plavix, his PRU yeah. today is uh, 220 okay. and we are ACT is 330. So, yeah. straight away an attitude uh, and a compulsive strategy to do absolutely what is what is needed. Yes. Do not go yeah. beyond to all the, the circumflex no, 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 and no, no. Uh, so, I mean that was a absolutely outstanding uh, review of uh, so many important uh, questions and how you analyze the data from absorb 2 and uh, correlated uh, I think uh, very importantly to some of the differences as was noticed in China and how you are doing uh, yourself at Mount Sinai. And uh, I have some questions coming from the audience plus some of mine to follow up and hopefully in the middle of uh, a quieter moment in the case we will take that. So, this is a 175 bar uh, 7 French uh, VL guide. Yeah. That's it. VL 3 -0. VL3O. Got we it. initially went yeah. with VL35, but uh, the, yeah. the once you have a long sheath, most of the tortuosity is taken care, right. then you need a shorter guide. That is what happened. So, same I think left main, we knew for the left main, we probably need a bigger burr, which we do not want to do. So, the plan will be go with the 175 burr and we are already ready with a cutting balloon. We do a cutting balloon of the distal left main. And the patient is tolerating this no problem. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. You can show the hemodynamics, when will we change that? No, we should post. No, for them, they are asking questions. We cannot show three, only two, two channel only for the okay. time. We actually trying to get a three channel uh, display, so hemodynamics all the time along with the picture in picture. Right. Uh, and so, but uh, it will take about few months. 
particularly for such cases that could yes. be very useful. So this is very important. He said 20 second. You come back all the way, and place the rotational uh, bar where you think. If you go back to the angiogram, not in the left main, but if you see the proximal LED is essentially non-obstructive. So you come back all the way and leave the bar in the proximal LED. So now when I start burring, I have completed the mid LED. Now I'll just go, go all the way to distal LED. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do the pecking motion right here. That's where the tightest lesion is. Just go slow. What's the speed there? It's like 156. Okay. Again, another 20 seconds. You're yeah, pausing yeah. and you'll make another run. Just so we know, just too much sedation, that's the problem. And to give some hair doll or no? It just keeps waking up now and then. Yeah, a little hair doll so you can just completely sed it. Okay, we're going back again. The tight as lean and yeah, yeah. there is a difficulty, you can always go with the 1.5 one one five. bar. Do one more or you want to go to speed a little higher slightly? It's a 1.75 bar. I don't think we should go with the high speed. Okay. No? So one more try. Give one okay. more try. Go a little bit high speed. Make it to 1.75 bar. Yeah, yeah, in the. No, no, no. 1.75 with 1.75 bar. Now we have 160, we are 150 before. Right. Still exactly getting stuck at the same place. It's strange when you look at it angiographically, the calcification looks less there. Okay. Okay, coming out, we are going to change to 1.5, which will probably go more distally. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll cross in five seconds. Right. With 1.5. Maybe a few millimeters left for us to complete. So this Sanu is a kind of a patient uh, you definitely would go with the rotablator. Don't yeah. go with the. Hundred percent. Right. Otherwise, same. You'll do multiple. Uh, balloon dilation, stent is not going to reach there, then you have to use cutting balloon. And may not be able to expand. Expand the yeah. stent. Yeah. Yeah. And see that every time we went to the mid uh, LED, it's he became very restless. So it tells so you that it was really causing ischemia, ischemia. So tremendous ischemia. Samin, so in the cases, uh, you mentioned you've done 50 cases at Mount Sinai with the uh, absorb. How much was your post dilatation pressure? You mean about 20. Okay, so major difference between the yeah. 14 and 20, yes. And uh, the OCT use? And OCT use actually, we are not used OCT in some cases with where there was a ISR, uh, but, no, no, uh, I mean couple but majority of, uh, of them. Yeah, uh, proximal or, vessel or ISR, we. Or very large proximal vessel, but uh, majority of them, uh, like 82 percent and so, done with the OCT. Because Tot we are trying I think to we get are the done data. Uh, yeah, total we have done 47 uh, absorb cases yeah. of those. We have 42 pair of cases we have OCT. And, and now this exclude our cases in the yeah. absorb uh, trial. We are uh, the trial of the absorb 3 as well as the absorb 4. And, and Anu, you found it uh, extremely helpful to use OCT? No, no, not uh, I mean the, their initial recommendation was that you have to size the um, uh, absorb stent based on the OCT criteria, but we did not do that. We went with uh, our eyeball criteria. Right. OCT was just, you probably OCT is more helpful post, post that you have, you know, the struts are well opposed. So, I mean, in the absorb two, how much right. was the use of OCT? No, OCT not was minimal. Us. It's minimal. all IVAS. Yeah. Mostly right. IVAS yeah. we had used. IVAS and then use the virtual histology and IVAS were not OCT. And in China, the Chinese study, they used more, more of what the imaging modality? Yes, IVAS. Actually, the, and there is a Japan, 
uh, they are actually they are doing using even angioscopy now. Japan is the only one which has the angioscopy, and they actually have shown same uh, the thrombus on the struts and so and so forth, or scaffold. I mean, to pull the wire back. Good. So this is the one five. Yeah, one five. So of course there was no need of your uh, uh, putting it on in the left main. Yeah. yeah. Just going to go with the mid LED. Good. So Anu, you were wrong by four minutes and forty seconds. It took yeah. twenty seconds and not five minutes. Enough, right? Yeah. We don't need yeah. to go yeah. distal yeah. then. Very good choice of downsizing okay. here. Okay, coming out. And particularly these patients, you had to be ahead of the curve. Right. Cannot have a slow flow and so. So every time we went to the mid, he still moved his uh, left leg. Let so me the run through wire. Yeah. You want to clean your nose? I'll take care of it. Huh? So any other uh, lesion modifying mm -hmm. strategy mm -hmm. or? Yeah. Uh, so I would say. The, the, probably for the mid will be okay, uh, but uh, for uh, definitely for the distal left main, we plan to do a 4-0 or 3-0 uh, either flex dome or... Uh, uh, we actually took a 3-5 flex dome. 3-5 yeah. mm. flex dome is okay too. Uh, we will have yeah. to do distal left main yeah. into osteal yeah. LED. Good. Samin, right time for you to continue on with the very mm -hmm. other important thing. Yeah, exactly. So, let's go back. Uh, quickly so that we finish while we are uh, doing this part uh, and so and second is the very important that is the guideline for PCI or cardiac cath with the tower that's a very important now this is a little busy slide but I took it right from the uh, council ACC council uh, latest uh, uh, international council recommendation uh, that is the tower has been approved and uh, clearly that uh, while every patient with the tower required coronary angiography if you go by the guidelines of the appropriateness use criteria and patients are asymptomatic, you may call it a inappropriate for catheterization and particularly for intervention once you find the, the, the significant vessel disease. So if you go to the lower part, there is no evidence proving that tower without prior PCI of severe CAD is safe because all prior randomized clinical trial that led to approval of tower required revascularization of significant coronary stenosis in main epicardial vessel within 30 days of tower or I mean 30 plus days of power tower. Therefore, it, it would be wrong to extrapolate current ACCHA recommendation against invasive procedure in asymptomatic patients, AS patient to the tower population when evaluating the quality of care by cardiologist or hospital. That means you are making them inappropriate, which is not true because the, we know that every patient has to have a cardiac catheterization as a part of the tower. Now, we know the ACCHA, our guidelines are the appropriateness use criteria, which takes into account symptoms, non visual testing, maximum medical therapy and coronary anatomy. Now, look at this one. non visual testing, uh, risk assessment and maximum medical therapy, both are contraindicated in many of our AS patients. So, very, very important point. Uh, and uh, so the, therefore, if you put many of the cases, will be in the inappropriate red grid. Uh, and so, so therefore, the tower is an effective non-surgical option for patients with severe AS that will increasingly be performed in the future. We know the optimal treatment strategy of treating concomitant coronary artery disease has not been tested prospectively in a randomized clinical trial. Nevertheless, it is standard practice in the USA to perform coronary angiography and PCI for significant CAD more than one month of the tower implantation. And this actually data goes back. The first data came from the Cleveland Clinic by Samir Kapadia that to see the appropriate patients with the tower, those who have CAD, you do a PCI and have an equal outcome as those who do not have a CAD. And of course, uh, the cabbage versus tower in patients with severe aortic stenosis sorry, cabbage versus PCI plus tower uh, shown equal um, outcome. So, it makes sense uh, and then this is actually PCI versus uh, a TAVI alone or PCI, particularly patients with the extensive CAD makes sense to do a PCI before the TAVI placement. And of course, the limitation of our anatomical and physiological criteria, criteria for appropriateness of the uh, OCH use, we know is the trouble, excite testing, cannot happen many of them, FFR may be contraindicated, may cause 
bradycardia hypotension increase after load so ffr may be uh, the the basically uh, inconclusive and so then then ifr people say maybe the ifr but ifr obviates some of these concern but given the diminished flow reserve in as due to higher resting flow there may be an inherent accuracy because nobody has tested in the setting of as exertional dyspnea or chest pain which could be a marker of the cad is very difficult to differentiate and lastly the pci alone may resolve symptoms therefore the decision to pursue ps pci and tower must be made considering that uh, uh, clinical information and this actually goes back to the latest uh, in our jack intervention of this week last week that the rationale for performance of coronary angiography and stenting before transcatheter aortic valve replacement the guideline from the leadership council of the american college of cardiology international section really puts that together that all patients should get uh, the coronary angiogram if there is no cad proceed the tower if you have cad then you go with the where the cad is left main or proximal their data are left main uh, tower registry showed that left main can safely be done in the tower patients osteal rc osteal left main may be a little tricky because if they stand hanging at the time of the tower it may crush them but that's a small group but majority that if you have a proximal epicardial the disease then you consider pci at before the uh, tower usually rarely we do at the same time but do it before if there is no pro proximal disease but there is a 90% om or 90% large diagonal so you have to decide at that point based on the myocardium at risk if you really think that patients have symptoms are coming from uh, not necessarily uh, the, uh, the uh, as only there is a 90% lesion probably consider uh, pci pre tower if not none of these are present then reasonable to proceed with the tower so reassess the cad after tower in cases biggest problem is that uh, the doing a pci after the tower sometimes is very challenging so you need to decide if you need to patient needs pci you probably need to do it pre tower rather than post tower of course many of these patients now post tower keeps coming back and we end up in doing the pci later on so therefore i conclude here that the management of cad in patient with undergoing tower should be individualized based on the patient's overall clinical condition and anatomy these patients have contraindication to stress testing and based on previous clinical trial and protocol mandate that all should get the coronary angiography and pci should be considered for major coronary epicardial uh, vessels uh, although if uh, the not covered in the guideline but that is the standard practice based on the uh, randomized trial so we can go to the now angiogram uh, yeah. all we have done is yeah. pre dilated with a 3o balloon distal led to mid led and now this is the flex tome 3o we are going at 35 35 we are going up to 10 down distal left main question will be i think we will end up with the three stents or you think we should just do two no, stents three stents probably three you end up in mid to distal mid and then left main three no the left main do we take care one from no. the distal left main all the way to led still want to cover. Two thirty eights can cover it no you have to go at uh, the three o'clock back so we take a three o distally yeah so i mean yeah. excellent review three o thirty eight such a such a difficult topic uh, so many issues which come up uh, so one of the things uh, the guidelines did not relate to but you had covered it very elegantly in your uh, initial part is exactly the temporizing role of balloon uh, valvuloplasty prior to doing pci in a case like today yeah the yeah, actually the this which i did not show uh, in the the structural heart disease and tower guidelines they actually favor that while your patients being prepared for tower knowing that sometimes it takes one month two months to prepare the patient if they are in the trial secondly there is a possible hemodynamic deterioration while patients are waiting getting extra dilute all the testing and so the balloon valvuloplasty in preparation preparing the patients for tower or savr or surgery is appropriate so no longer a class 3 it becomes now class 2 and 2b that yes you need to optimize your patient there are some data to show that uh, doing a uh, balloon valvuloplasty your makes your patients better uh, in terms of uh, your better outcome in the partner trial for the short term 6 8 months although at 1 2 years there was no longer any difference but i know that in many of these cases 
we stabilize the patient by performing the tower, uh, by, by performing the balloon valvoplasty uh, before the actual tower. The question then comes that uh, you would ordinarily time it about one month after doing the PCI. Yeah, that's if right. you have performed a balloon valvuloplasty during the index PCI, yeah. does the timing of tower change? Yeah, you actually, you want to go a little longer. Right. Reason is exactly. that you have gone through just like this case, 11 fresh sheath, probably wait two months now. Now there's no rush because you open the valve just like a moderately open we did in this particular case. Other wire is out. I yeah. pulled the other yeah, one. So out. like this particular case, uh, moderate. Uh, so you have already improved the valve area. So you could wait two to three months. Yeah. To me, that's Stop. a better timing because that allows the femoral arteries to heal mm -hmm. because that's where you have to go non again, uh, puncturing them and so and so forth. Excellent. And the dual antiplatelet regimen okay. stays the same. Yeah, it's the same. I, I mean, the only question comes, uh, and that's actually the very important point, which they highlight in this particular document, and that is, if you have a non-femoral approach or for, the, for your uh, tower access, like transapical, okay. right. subclavian, direct aortic, that gets a little tricky. Because there, if you are already on antiplatelet therapy, you bleed more. Right. So the question was that actually there was some recommendation that maybe those cases, once you have these alternate approach, maybe you do a PCI at the same time, so uh, you, so that you don't expose these patients. So now right. many of these patients who come to us already have PCI, but there are the direct aortic access or uh, uh, we don't do the transapical or subclavian. So what we do is we do not load them until post tower. So idea is therefore because the bleeding is a major issue in these patients, so you want to wait uh, till the tower is done and then only we do a loading Ready? of the antiplatelet therapy. Right. Well, it's a Okay, now this is the stent in the mid uh, LED actually looks, looks very good. Excellent. I think Good a 38, 35, 32, in fact, will cover the whole thing, no? Well, I, I saw you saw you trying to measure that with the, yeah. the balloon which you removed. Good to go with 38 full coverage. No, it's too much overlap. No, will not be. And the okay, three, they get us a 3, 5, 38. Three, five, right. Yeah. Or 4 oh. This was 3 oh. This is a 3 oh. Okay. Samin, so three, five, doing uh, three, five, for... And proximally these, left main you can uh, dilate for yeah. These are so many yeah. sick uh, people uh, trying to assess some of their uh, peripheral anatomy and uh, a CT is a overkill uh, before uh, the procedure? Ah. No, this um, patient did have CT okay. as a part Got of it. a tower workup. Yeah. So we whether, CT. Yeah, but I mean we, know right. we know both, ves both sides uh, were bad, but we still have to. But yes, yeah, CT is a must. The question comes is, like patient I did yesterday, who had a both, I did a, another patient who had a, a severe AS, the gradient was 60 mean gradient and has a graft gone. So we did an orbital ethnectomy, put two stents in the circumflex and put a two uh, and then did a balloon valvuloplasty. That case, I would not do a CT now. I let the patient go and come back in four, five, six weeks uh, and that day, the elective day, do a surgical consultation and whatever is needed on at that time in one shot. So, so no, so don't give any additional dye because this patient had to come back uh, for rest of their workup. So now, what we'll do in that particular case, the we can do uh, the just uh, some PFTs uh, and uh, carotid. Those are part of the uh, minimum requirement. So that you want to do. Take a picture. Go, yeah. No, no, you're good. And of course, Anu, you changed the view to get a better appreciation of the left main there yeah. and the origin of the circ. Exactly. Yeah. So Samin, uh, all over the world, uh, no, no, the, be good, be good. I was oh, at uh, the Cardiology dollars. Society of India's meeting uh, yeah, in India a last high week. Yeah. Fifteen. And, and the surgeons there, uh, you know, which is not different no. than anywhere else, uh, they are constantly stating that uh, the degree of difficulty of their cases has exponentially increased. Yes. Now, as much sympathy I have for that, I start getting the same feeling with what you are doing, that uh, I think gone are the days that uh, you were doing these uh, simple cases, that uh, your profile of cases is turning into the kind we are seeing today. No, I can tell you there are a lot of papers which have come that overall STS risk when you take a center, who's getting a surgical valve, now of course uh, it's approved for intermediate risk, even before that. So overall patients, the mortality, STS risk score of the 
surgical uh, aortic valve replacement versus tower is totally different, much higher with the tower, more comorbid conditions, more higher mortality because those are the sicker patients because they never see the day of light for the surgical point of view. Uh, that, that completely makes sense yeah. and uh, Samin going back to there are so many uh, unanswered questions which remain regarding uh, BVS. Uh, so, the easy one of the easy fix is going to be that uh, the technical aspects are addressed, uh, there is better uh, more compulsive imaging, um, higher uh, post dilatation pressures. But that is not going to be all, no? I mean it requires a modification in the designing of the struts and the BVS too. Very, very, very important point. Actually there were, uh, besides this uh, which I did not share, uh, that there was a big BVS, uh, uh, the symposium where the six other, uh, the Phantom, Elixir, uh, other Reva, so other BVS stent data were presented including Biomine. Uh, from uh, uh, from uh, India, all all showing that very low, uh, actually Miras, uh, particularly uh, which is the bioabsorbable from uh, Merrill, uh, uh, Miras of 106 cases and so, the initial six month data extremely, extremely good uh, with a no throm scaffold thrombosis and so, but I tell everybody, do not be fooled by that. Why? Because we have those data in absorb A and B. Right. And they were nothing there except one case had a non-QMI but no scaffold thrombosis. But unless you go to the more complex and randomized trial, those individual data of the six months looking very good uh, does not have any meaning in my opinion. Did they, did they still look at uh, improvements in vasomotion though? Uh, well, that will be at the later time. Right. The vasor, the, those vasomotion, remember the vasomotion comes into equation only after two years when you start disintegrating. Uh, the, 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 the disintegrating uh, the scaffold and that is why Patrick Soraya very smartly uh, put this uh, the wage of motion at three years as a primary endpoint. But only my question is wage of motion to the nitroglycerin is just a little you know it is like a hoax. You need to have a wage of motion uh, either you want to constriction or dilatation to papaverine or acetylcholine right. because all the studies in the past for the wage of motion have involved uh, one of those uh, agent. Ready? Yeah. And similarly, like the assessment of uh, angina should also, I mean, it really makes uh, a difference long term, no? Yeah, that, that's, but, but again, okay, you know, down, this, down. yeah, it, uh, to me, I think it's again, uh, but the, the making that as a primary endpoint in the absorb 4 was again, little overkill. I mean, right. you can make a uh, angina resolution as your primary endpoint, which is so subjective, which is so subjective. But uh, to me, the absorb 4 has a bigger question to answer it by the 4000 patient trial i think uh, 24 2500 patients have been done but the the data had to be shown uh, very quickly that how has been the stent scaffold thrombosis in those patients uh, compared to now we know that will never be a zero uh, or uh, the even zions zero which they got in absorb 2 because uh, in all the absorb trials it is like 0 0.6 0 0.7 at one year with the zions and about 1.5 or 1.8 uh, you are exactly right. I yeah. think the urgency right. is also required to yeah. regain the faith. Otherwise, uh, the the yeah. utilization yeah. of PBS has gone down. Uh, significantly gone down. Absolutely, because one uh, you know largely because of the community. I know that since it has done, uh, the few of the patients actually have uh, come, and I mentioned the one point. Do we need to post that. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a picture or no? Okay, go see that. Okay. Anu, we have uh, maintained our focus on so many of the didactics and the important issue and uh, neglected uh, to appreciate the remarkable skills you have displayed in this extraordinarily difficult case. Uh, the balloon valvuloplasty was done elegantly, the PCI which was most complex by itself, not to mention with the addition of, uh, of the aortic stenosis. A beautifully done case, uh, excellent techniques with the Rotablation. I think the decision to downsize was 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 brilliant. I I I don't know if the outcome could have been so good had you not treated uh, the mid LED uh, going distal with the smaller bar. Okay, so perfect. Let's uh, come to a closure uh, from this point of view. We take home message. And also not bad, Samin, considering uh, in uh, about uh, 38 minutes you have done a, uh, a balloon valvuloplasty and a complex uh, calcified uh, distal left main and uh, proximal and mid LED. That's we a have a similar. Super.
Similar few other cases lined up. They accept, yeah. except they will not be on the camera. <laughs> Fantastic, Anu. Great skills and uh, so many teaching points uh, from this case today. Samin, Thank go you. ahead. Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead so with you your... The, what uh, Dr. Keen is doing is the proximal LED has not been post dilated. 4 over is too big. So, she is going with a 3.5 just to post dilate. So, let's yeah. go to Thank our uh, conclusion. Long term absorbed BVS and uh, guideline for PCI. The three year absorbed two trial data 20. have raised serious concern about the safety and effectiveness of absorbed BVS. These negative results can well be explained by improper BVS implantation technique used in the absorbed 2 trial. Because we used to tell, don't go high pressure, because you are going to otherwise disrupt the scaffold. No. It is expected that trials absorbed 3 and 4 using proper BVS implantation technique, which we call PSP, uh, pre-dilatation, appropriate sizing, post-dilatation will have a different uh, results. And we expect that. Second. Recent guideline about coronary angiography and intervention patients undergoing tower implantation have suggested PCI of significant lesions in proximal vessels irrespective of stress test or physiological testing. Patients with complex CAD indication of tower plus PCI versus sour plus cabbage should be reconsidered because if you have very complex PCI and you think there is an option of the surgery, I think those patients should go for uh, surgery um, maybe uh, rather than just going for the tower. So quickly, we are going to take uh, three questions uh, here. One is the following. Take a, we will take a last picture with the online, uh, if you wait. Following statements are true regarding the three results of the absorbed two trial, except patient-oriented MACE was similar between two groups. A scaffold thrombosis was higher with absorbed versus, uh, versus uh, Zions. Numerically higher mortality in absorbed versus Zions. Higher MI ra rates in absorb versus Zions and largely TLR was okay. numerically higher in absorb versus Good. Zions. Can you take the button out? The last one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Take the button. Second question. Follow up, uh, following are the possible explanation of adverse BVS outcome in absorb 2 trial. Lower incidence of post dilatation, lower post dilatation pressure, depth discontinuation, lower acute gain and final MLD and all of the above. And the third question is the recent guidelines about the coronary angiography and PCI. In tower, patients have recommended the following except routine coronary angiography be done in all tower patients, proximal CAD with average STS risk score undergo tower and PCI, FFR guided PCI is not routinely done due to AS, stress imaging may not be possible in many cases, and PCI is preferably be done along with tower in same sitting. So these are basically that which one is wrong. So just to say that clearly this field is uh, revolving uh, very uh, ad advancing very rapidly and we are ready to take the last picture now and for the question answers you need to go to the website and all the questions will be there. Question answers will be there. Anu satisfied uh, uh, with the final results? Yeah, it looks very good. We just wanted to make sure uh, you know. The, this caudal picture is the most important for us to make sure the, I'm, I was trying to get the guide out a little bit, but I think every time I try to get the guide out, it's just uh, completely coming out of the coronary to see the, um, you know, proximal edge of the stent. But you see the distal edge of the stent looks good and your circ is nice. Yeah. Anu, excellent skills. Uh, Samin, uh, just a magnificent uh, review of uh, some very complex <laughs> issues. I'm sure the... Pablo? Audience has uh, found them uh, to be to be extremely helpful. Uh, Samin, uh, congratulations to your team. Uh, this concludes uh, the last case of 2016. Uh, Twelve uh, beautifully performed uh, cases this year, uh, all hopefully with uh, excellent uh, learning tips. Uh, we conclude uh, today's session. In many ways, I consider this uh, and highly recommend people to review this. Uh, this is our first. Uh, dedicated uh, approach to dual pathology of uh, severe AS and complex coronary artery, artery disease. Uh, happy holidays to all of you and uh, we'll see you in the new year on January the 17th.